I've decided I'm going to answer your noble and salacious questions because one day I'm going to die. So why shouldn't I gossip about myself? What bras do you wear in your videos and what's your bra size? I'm going to answer this question with the pursuit of knowledge in mind and with so much sincerity that I think I might change you. But my answer might be a little bit confusing if you don't know about specialty bras. So with a lace bra, I'm a 32E. With a sports bra, I'm a 30F. In a mass-produced bra shop, I'm probably a 34 triple D because they'll try to convince you that you're the only size available because they don't make cup sizes bigger than D's at any of those stores. I wouldn't get too excited about this information or place some great value on these numbers because bra sizes are a scam. I'm sorry. It's funny to say this out loud, but Bra sizes aren't science-based, they're industry-determined, and it changes throughout every single different country. Clothing and bra sizes are relatively new inventions that came with the mass production of garments. In the olden timey days, I would have just had my mom who knows all of my measurements and would make me a dress that would fit my body perfectly. The thing is, it's kind of hard to make a bra that fits most people, so mass-produced bras don't really make sense. Boobs are like magical squishies that move around and they change in density and size throughout the month or how you're taking your hormones or where you are in your life or what weight you are. So how does it make sense to like put a number to it? Being a D or over is a lot more common than you think. It isn't this like coveted magical thing that you can't ever achieve. Lots of people are Ds or over. So why don't big companies like Victoria's Secret make sizes over Ds? The answer is because it's less sellable. We've decided that the D is the perfect size, and anything bigger is freakish and too big, and less sellable. So they invent things like a triple D, so that they can still stay at the perfect standard. The industry calculation is done by measuring the underboob and the boob circumference. The relationship between squish and tummy is vital to the calculation. If the measurement isn't exact, or your bra is kind of fitting weirdly even though you think that you're this size, you can choose the sister size. That's two band sizes up and one cup size down, or two band sizes down and one cup size up. So 32C is the sister size of 30D. So I'm actually scamming all of you. It's very, very possible that somebody with a 36C actually has bigger boobs than me, but because everything is done by ratios and because I'm a short small lady, my ratios are more extreme. So it makes it seem like my boobs are bigger, but they're probably not. Will I relinquish this power? Will I relinquish this number? No. I don't have that much power in this world, so I want this like very specific power, but I know it's corrupt. Now I'm gonna tell you something that will also off-gate any sort of like accidental gloating that I did before when I said I'm like a short, small lady. And that is that big, strong shoulders and a strong waist or a thick waist is way better for carrying big boobs. First of all, an hourglass is created from a strong, broad shoulder, and then it comes down like this and goes out like that. If you have narrow shoulders or a small waist, you don't get that beautiful extreme hourglass, unless you have like enormous hips, which I do not. Me? Probably dying soon because my shoulders really hurt and my back hurts, and I get migraines from that. Her? She's like carrying you into battle and like tending to your wounds and carrying like sacks of potatoes over her shoulders and like is running with her beautiful boobs heaving or something like that, you know what I mean? So the fixation with proportions and a cup size is kind of just a society-wide delusion that there is a perfect boob size and honestly that there's a perfect body size. But there isn't. It's propaganda. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, if you are very emotionally attached to your bra size and you've gone online and taken like 16 different measurements of your boobs, including just like them hanging down and then like to the side and stuff like that, 
I think that's like totally legit and you can have that. And I feel attached to my size too. So I think we're on the same page. All I'm saying is that it doesn't mean everything. <laughs> okay? <laughs> doesn't mean everything. So what bras do I wear in my videos? I always wear t-shirt bras. T-shirt bras are basically just full coverage push-up bras that look really good under a t-shirt and it makes your boobs look like round and you know they look really cartoony and cinematic. I'm of the opinion that cinematic bras will kill you early. Yeah, that's my opinion. But I think it's right. <laughs> they <laughs> mess up your posture, they pull your neck forward and your back forward and they give you back pain. In real life? Not here? This ain't real life? Uh, I go braless, or I wear my lace bra, and my lace bra is like high tech, it's like high quality tech. So I have no tension, there's no weight on my shoulders with my lace bra. It's all in the wire, and this like super powerful wire that goes up in here and holds everything on the chest. So all the weight, it's on my waist, and it's holding it good. Nothing is happening to my shoulders, but right now, this is a cinematic bra. It's hurting me. It's pulling me. It's pulling me into the grave. But I gotta look cute. <laughs> Big bra shops will increasingly try and sell you wider and wider straps, especially if you come in and you're like, I have back problems, I want something that's really supportive. They'll be like, oh, we have some really thick, powerful straps. No, you want the power here. You want the weight here, where they are. You know why they don't <laughs> make ones that are really powerful here? Because they don't look cinematic. They like place them separate. You see these girls, they're like a unit right now? No, a non-cinematic bra will cup them and protect them separately. And that doesn't look awesome. Well, it looks nice in my opinion, but it doesn't look like you're like taking two squishy little bunnies and like putting them together and like encasing them in a beautiful leopard print. Also, I'm not poo-pooing cinematic bras. They have a purpose. They have a very grand purpose. Sometimes I want to cosplay my boobs like they are feral little leopards or blossoming little flowers. They look good and it's really fun to like have cute underwear. <laughs> and you know what? It's also really cheap. It's cheap to find like a cinematic epic bra or at least it's affordable. So I'm not saying go out and buy an extremely specialty bra especially if you don't feel like you need it or you don't wear bras. I'm just saying that cinematic bras can erode your shoulders and they will kill me. Do you have an OnlyFans or what do you think about OnlyFans? And I've been asked this on so many different levels, obviously on a transactional level, but also I just recently had a really good conversation about it from an artistic standpoint. And the answer is, one. I think that people don't realize that having an OnlyFans is actually a full-time job. You have to be amazing at makeup and hair and waxing and shaving and making like adorable little noises and filming yourself at really sexy amazing angles and you have to have a marketing voice and a way that you speak to your customers and you're constantly speaking to your customers. It isn't just like something cute you can do. It's a job. It's an artistic practice, and I have an artistic practice. I make weird, disturbing, and kind of sensual videos that sometimes make people feel and think about things differently. And I want to be appreciated for the exact thing that I do. 
I'd say I'm not a hotness practitioner, I'm more of a hotness scholar. The word genius is usually used to describe a couple different things. People who are very talented in their fields, specifically like mathematics and science and engineering. People who are very talented at instruments, or maybe they're a prodigy of some sort of thing. Or maybe they're a pioneer in their field, let's say like comedy, like Tim Heidecker or Nathan Fielder. But sometimes when you get too gross, or too sexy or too weird in a specific category, you aren't considered a genius or a pioneer anymore. You're just a weird little oddity that people discovered on the internet. Sometimes I feel like people act like my videos happened by accident or they appeared in front of them by magic or something like that, which is kind of cute and nice, but also it's like I don't own my own videos or I didn't purposely make all these decisions, but I did. I make all the costumes and I make all the backgrounds and I make all the video editing and I make all the decisions about makeup and everything. And so it's a strange phenomenon to feel like I don't actually own this thing that people are watching because of the weirdness level. When something becomes really cringeworthy or really strange, it's almost as if it appeared by the universe for you. And that's a strange thing. There's an artist I really admire named Shaori who made disturbing videos of herself eating food and dancing in front of the camera in 2015. In my eyes, there's no doubt that she's a genius. She's been making vertical videos where she's like dancing sexy way, way before TikTok. But no one thinks of her as a genius, or at least that's not how people covered her in the news. They covered her like she appeared magically on the internet and awed everybody with her strange little dances. But what happens when you're just like an internet oddity is that you're not actually treated like a legacy and the things that you inspired and the people you inspired don't get attributed to you. You were just a weird thing that they found. I feel like people don't talk about her anymore. Kind of the same way that people don't talk about viral and weird YouTube videos that were really influential. And that's because there wasn't the same kind of ownership over things and the same kind of branding. It was like, yeah, I remember that weird little video I watched on the internet, but I don't remember who made it. It kind of just like magically appeared in front of me out of virality. So to some of you, I'm just a little teddy bear trapped in a terrarium. And I like being in a terrarium. I'm okay. I'm okay. What is your biggest regret? When I was living in China for a year, I became really close friends with this girl that I went to school with. She spoke amazing conversational English and I spoke really poor Mandarin. We'd spend a lot of time having really funny conversations going back and forth between languages, trying to find like the perfect one word to describe a huge, enormous, catastrophic feeling. At the end of my trip, I was spending more time with my then boyfriend and less time with her. Before I left, I said a huge goodbye to her and I gave her a huge hug and I cried and I told her I'd want to keep in touch with her, but I didn't get her email or social media because I had her WeChat. But I haven't spoken to her for 10 years because I lost my WeChat account and I miss her and I want to like know how she's doing. So my biggest regret is just not treasuring her more and not getting her contact information. So if there's a weird chance you remember my name and last name and you're watching this, hi, I miss you. I wear this dress because I thought you might think it's cute. Do you like it? This is a dress that I bought um, recently at a vintage shop and my goals for it are that I wear it this summer and people think in their head when they see me in it, wow, she's so here is a list of books that I've read last year, and I'm gonna start off with sci-fi because it's my favorite genre. Okay, so I just finished reading Aurora by Kim Stanley Robinson. He's considered to be like a hard science fiction author, meaning that when he writes fiction, he uses real scientific theories, which is really, really cool. So the story follows a generation ship. 
My generation ship is basically an interstellar arc starship that's journey is going to be longer than the people's lifespans that are in the ship. So the people who board the generation ship are planning to go to the star that's really, really far away. But the people that actually end up at the star have never actually been to Earth before because they're a couple of generations later. The story asks, is humanity linked to Earth? Is it even worth it or possible to colonize and terraform other planets? And is there nobility in wanting to go home to a planet that you've never been to before? Seed to Harvest by Octavia Butler. This story takes place over hundreds of years, so you get to see the secret history of telepathic mind controllers and a group of people who have been enhanced by an alien plague. It's freaky, and it's great, and I love Octavia Butler, and I highly recommend it. It's got selective breeding, it's got shape-shifting, it's got very interesting questions about gender and race. Fledgling by Octavia Butler. It's basically a science fiction vampire novel. It follows this girl named Shori, who's a 53-year-old Ina vampire, who looks like a 10-year-old girl. This is actually my least favorite of all of her novels, which is really sad to say because it's her last novel, but I don't really like the format of murder mysteries, and it seemed like that was mostly the theme of the whole novel, and you could tell it was supposed to be a series, but she passed before she could finish it, so it's only just one little novel. So. I just gotta be honest, you know? I reread A Song for Laia, which I do like every couple months. It's the hive mind book to control all hive mind books. The Murder Bot Diaries by Martha Wells. It's about a socially anxious murder bot who loves soap operas. It's super relatable and super fun to read. So I would definitely recommend this if you have a little nerdy sweetie pie in your life that doesn't read a lot. Okay, now we're gonna move on to fantasy. I'm currently reading the Brandon Sanderson Stormlight Archive series and I love it so much. I love the world building. It has great female characters. It tells a very vast war story, but it tells it from all the different perspectives of different people in different ranks of society. So you don't feel like you're just getting like the nobility perspective or just a soldier's perspective. It's so good, I love the world. It's not as like edgy and sexy as George R. R. Martin, but it gives you more like mm, satisfying moments where you're like, yeah, you did so good. Cause George R. R. Martin doesn't let you have those. He gives you those small moments and then he like takes it away from you, which I get. Like he wants to tell a story about how war is never glamorous and nice and beautiful for anybody, even if you're on the noble side. But sometimes you just, you know, you just want a fun fantasy series and Brandon Sanderson will give you that. So I read three of the Sabriel series by Garth Nix. After the first book, I was like, wow, this might be the best fantasy series I've ever read in my life. After the second book, I was like, hmm, I wish the world was more fleshed out, but I guess you're gonna do that throughout the whole series, so that's okay. After the third book, I feel like they really did flesh things out a lot more, but it didn't feel great. It felt kind of hollow. I wanted it to be richer. The story is actually very interesting. It follows a mostly female line of necromancers who have these amazing little bells that they have to manipulate that open different realms to bring the dead into those realms to their final resting place. I was just kind of disappointed about how every book had the exact same stakes. Like every single book you had to save the world. I don't know. I was a little disappointed, but maybe I'll keep reading. I also read Wicked, which is the alternative history to the Wicked Witch of the West, and I was pretty disappointed, actually, because I liked the musical. But I just felt like they had this metaphor for the oppression of anthropomorphic animals, and it was supposed to be a metaphor for racism or sexism or something like that, and I felt like it was really poorly done. If you want an amazing example of that, I would watch Beastars, the anime. Oh my god. Okay, this category I'm gonna put as obsessive, scary ladies who are writing kind of depressive books and books to maybe change your mind about things. The Ethical Slut by Dossie Easton and Janet Hardy. This is a guide to non-monogamy. I went into this book being like, yeah, I know I'm biased and I'm just gonna own my biasness and it's not really hurting anybody. And I left the book being like, I think I have hurt people, and also my worldview is completely different now. 
Disfigured, colon, On Fairy Tales, Disability, and Making Space by Amanda Liddock. An analysis of monsters and disability in fairy tales. I went into this book being like, yeah, I know what you're going to say, and I've already figured this out. And I left the book being like, oh, you taught me some things that I had no idea about or I didn't think about, so I'm glad I read it. Welcome to the Goddamn Ice Cube by Blair Braverman. It's about a woman who has PTSD who's trying to become a dog sledder in the Arctic. It kind of really is about a woman on a goddamn ice cube. There's a lot of talk about sexual assault, but it's also about finding the beauty of an isolated place and the danger and magic that comes with it. And it's a very uplifting and magical read. I liked it. So Sad Today by Melissa Broder. Oh my god, I love Melissa Broder. So Sad Today is a group of essays, and I will warn you, this is a kind of disgusting author. Everything she writes about is really, really gross. I don't know why I'm so drawn to female characters that have like eating disorders and are obsessive and anxious and are total weirdos. I just love this side of like creepy femininity. The Pisces by Melissa Broder. I started reading this book and I immediately called all of my close friends and told them to take it out from the library even though I was hoarding the only copy of the book from the library because I wanted them to get in line because it was so good. There's a very, very disturbing horror element in it but I can't tell you what it is. All I have to say is take that book out from the library. It's gonna creep you out and move you for an entire year. So now I think I'm gonna bully this nature book because this nature book just like loves what it's talking about so much and it's having so much fun with the illustrations. And I just think, I just think it needs to be taken down a peg. So they call this illustration the fiery sea and I'm like, okay, calm down. <laughs> Here they worked so hard to make like a really beautiful little swirly illustration of the earth and like the different water currents and I'm like, that's so cute that you guys did that. So this part is called the canopy of air, and I think it's actually pretty hard to represent air. So I think with this photograph, they did a pretty good job of that. Holy, look, look at all these, look at those beautiful underwater creatures. You really filled like every little speck of the page, you know that? You did a great job, but you did a lot. And I gotta bully you for that. And then they're like, let's draw a swamp. And let's like fill the entire swamp up. And then I looked at this drawing of these dinosaurs and I was like, pass. I'm not interested in these dinosaurs. I like dinosaurs, but these dinosaurs have no sex appeal to me. Here they changed up the angle of the drawing and I'm like, yeah, you got me with the deep sea creatures. Everybody loves deep sea creatures. This, I think, is a real photograph, and I'm like, how can that be real? How can these little aliens be real? But they're real. I wrote fake news on here, but I think it's real. And that's pretty wonderful. It's still really nerdy. The orange hues, you did this on purpose. You were like, this is my palette, and I'm gonna make everything in a beautiful orange hue. And I'm like, yeah. That's embarrassing that you did that, but it's a good artistic decision. Open this one up and I'm like, sand animals are special animals. You know, they are special animals. Doesn't mean you gotta make a beautiful, gorgeous illustration of it. Here they're like, oh, the theme is gonna be yellow. Like, we're gonna have different animals, but we're gonna have a very consistent yellow theme. They made that decision. This is a rainforest if I've ever seen a rainforest. Wow, and like this little uh, protect, we gotta, pro we gotta protect this one so much. We gotta protect this little rodent. But not that I like this drawing or anything. Just, it's very dense. This is the best page in the entire book. They filled every little corner. They're like, yeah. Give me another animal and I'll fit this in. Give me another one and I'll fit it in. I want this in my room. I come to this page and I'm like, stop. I'm not doing this anymore. Stop, you've gone too far. You're doing too much. This is excessive. I see this and I'm like, relax. I get that you love the earth. And I get that it's beautiful. But this is a little psychedelic. It's 
space. I do like space. I personally like space. We're gonna end with this little header, which I think is very dramatic, where they're like, the life and death of the stars. Okay. Nope.